Today, we're really honored to have uh, two representatives from Pennsylvania and a representative from Delaware. Uh, my name is Judd Pittman, and I'm the special consultant to the Secretary of Education here in Pennsylvania on STEM. And I'll be leading the conversation a little bit today, but really it's going to be driven by our panelists. And today we have uh, Lisa Stoner, who's representing um, Delaware uh, Department of Education, and she's the CTE policy advisor. So we have this nice uh, agency level lens, and then we have uh, Allison Dio, she's the director of the Clean Energy Center for the Pennsylvania College of Technology. And then she, um, she leads that sort of post-secondary space. And then we have Dr. Joe Fullerton, who's the current principal of the Pickering Technical College and High School in Chester County. Uh, and so he'll be able to talk to you a little bit about um, the work from the uh, high school lens. And as we're going through, much like the other sessions, I'll drop into the pat into the chat. There's the Padlet link, and that link will take you towards some spaces that we can continue to be generative around ideas and and share some success and spotlight stories from other places other than Pennsylvania. So please, as we're going through, don't hesitate to drop some information in there. If you have other questions or thoughts, uh, please dig in there as well. Um, and then sort of the, the run of the panel, we're going to give each of the presenters roughly about five to eight minutes to share their story. And then we're going to open it up for some collective dialogue. And I really thought that some of the information that uh, Patty Curtis shared this morning around job opportunities and the green economy and workforce set the stage for this particular conversation. I also, the, the last presentation by Ms. Shifter really made me think about uh, as we've been surveying and, and doing a lot of stakeholder engagement here in Pennsylvania over the last 10 to 18 months that we really do need to listen and honor the voices of students. If there's one thing that we've learned over the last year is that uh, climate science, environmental literacy, things that are, are topics that are related to the environment are things, or the UN sustainability goals even more uh, specifically, are things that students, at least in Pennsylvania, are ex care extremely uh, about and want to take action towards. And I can think of a couple panels where students have said, you know, you as adults, you do, you do a lot of talking and we're ready for action. And so I think that's a really great reminder and we need to, we, we need to channel that, that leadership and that energy more often. And our students have a lot of power to influence legislators, leaders, and, and do real science on a daily basis. So we need to set the conditions so that they can do that. Uh, and with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. Uh, we'll go ahead and let each of them do a little bit of an introduction and then dig into their work. And I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Lisa Stoner from the Delaware Department of Education. And then we'll kind of tunnel down into those layers from agency level to post-secondary to uh, 9 through 12. So uh, Ms. Stoner, do you want to go ahead and uh, start us off with the conversation? Sure. Thank you, Judd, and it certainly is an honor to be here today and also an honor to serve as a policy advisor for career and technical education or CTE at the Delaware Department of Ed and our Delaware CTE uh, work group and the Department of Education are really fortunate to be part of a much broader network of partners uh, that represent Delaware's executive branch, multiple state agencies, post-secondary partners, the K-12 system, employers, community-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, who all work together through an initiative called Delaware Pathways. And as such, um, we are working to make really direct connections between education and the workforce, and of course, to build our talent pipeline. So I'd like to spend a little time providing an overview of Delaware Pathways. Um, and that infrastructure, and then a few minutes talking about the opportunities to expand environmental literacy and green climate-focused career awareness opportunities for our students. So since 2015, the Delaware Pathways team has brought, again, these business education community leaders together to build a service model that connects middle school, to high school, continuing ed career and expands access to our high quality career pathways and of course the supports uh, every Delaware student. 
Um, the ultimate goal is to meet the um, and to increase the number of students and adults that are prepared to continue their education and to enter the workforce with a certificate, a license, a, or a degree, or another credential of value. So as a result, over the past five years, our industry leaders, community leaders, educators have implemented high school career pathways that integrate academic and hands-on technical content and now enroll over 23,000 students in almost every Delaware high school. Um, these career pathways were developed with business partners to address and align to the needs of regional and state economies in areas like healthcare and information technology, hospitality, manufacturing, agri-science, business marketing, education, computer science, engineering, and that's just really to name a few. So notably, these career pathways enable students to earn industry-recognized credentials, certificates, certificates, license, as well as early college credit and advanced standing, again, while they're still in high school. So students in Delaware Pathways also participate in early career experiences through a continuum of work-based learning that's supported by um, our Office of Work-Based Learning out of our Delaware Technical Community College. In addition, students in these career pathways are also provided, as I mentioned earlier, those supports and wraparound services, but both in school and out of school through partnering state agencies and our community-based organizations. So although we enroll and graduate over half of our high school students in these high quality, rigorous pathways, we know there's still a lot of work to be done. There always is. We recognize that there must be multiple points of access for every student, that not every student enters on an equal playing field, that we need to focus on readiness and transition, and that we need to focus on student identity, hearing the student voice, as Judd said, connecting the dots between in-school and out-of-school learning and work, and all while really building that sense of community and uh, that spirit of community. And you know, we feel the only way that we can make that happen is through our employers, our families, our students, our community educators all working together and hearing that student voice. So to that end, uh, multiple opportunities exist to build environmental literacy awareness and skills, um, as well as green uh, climate, again, focused career awareness through existing Delaware pathways. So for example, if you think about the skilled trades, if you think electrical construction, mechanical engineering, and that connection to say solar energy and, or maybe geothermal energy um, or public health. So think that, that air and water quality or transportation, uh, electric zero emissions vehicles um, or the business and marketing side of the green economy uh, through development and promotion. So this morning, I think Dr. King referenced opportunities through CTE to prepare students for careers in areas um, such as renewable energy and weatherization. Um, to that end, we must continue to collaborate with employers and use our labor market projections to determine and meet future green um, economic needs and really to develop where possible career focused programs. So expand on things that we already have in place, such as our environmental and natural resources pathway. Again, always a lot of work to be done and a lot of opportunities. So we're continuing to explore ways to promote career awareness early, connecting our employers, agency partners with our students in middle school and before, and then continuing those relationships through high school, um, making connections with post-secondary education that accelerates the time for students to earn industry-recognized credentials. So whether that be through a licensing or certification or degree program, or maybe by awarding advanced credit and credit for prior learning and credit for work-focused experiences. Um, we also have to continue to strengthen the existing relationships to, to promote uh, learning opportunities, both inside and out of the cl classroom, um, such as green career exploration. And we have other work-based learning experiences that we've already established with partners, such as our Department of Natural Resources uh, youth Conservation Corps and Internship Programs. So working together, 
we can better connect our students with the diversity of um, climate focused careers, build a pipeline from that middle school, high school, continuing education to careers that meets the unique, very unique needs of every student and that helps build our state and regional economies. Um, and in Delaware, we feel very fortunate to kind of have that infrastructure in place to make that happen through Delaware Pathways. So thanks for allowing me to share. Thanks, Lisa. That, that really reminds me, uh, a lot of what you talked about sounds like some of the sessions this morning around networking and building a network infrastructure. And you really spoke to bringing all those partners together to create the pathways for learners to not only actualize their interests, but to find the, the modes to build on those skills and get into the workforce. Uh, I also appreciate, you know, that sort of the feedback and really bringing business and industry to the table and making them push, you know, push their own comfort zone on where they can uh, enter into the green economy or where there's opportunities for that. You know, one of the things we talked about is that triple bottom line for sustainability and making sure that we're speaking to to a language that allows them to take part in this journey with us and open up opportunities for kids. So thank you for, for really sharing that journey. I think you, you left us with a great segue to talk with uh, Miss Allison Deal. She's the director of the Clean Energy Center here in Pennsylvania at the Pennsylvania College of Technology. So uh, Miss Deal, I was wondering if you could uh, speak to us a little bit about what you all are doing at the Clean Energy Center. Um, and just for folks reference in the agenda, uh, Miss Deal, provided us a few resources. So don't hesitate to drop into the agenda and grab those links. Sure, thank you. Um, and it's, it is an honor to be here. And I, I have to echo a lot of what um, Ms. Stoner was talking about with um, connecting that pipeline from high schools and CTEs all the way through workforce development programs and post-secondary education. There's just multiple ways. There's not a one size fits all approach, there just needs to be um, multiple ways that the younger generation can learn about green careers and find the best fit for them. So I've, uh, I've been with Penn College for 12 years and um, I love working here. It's a really unique institution that's focused on providing hands-on technical training for jobs that are in high demand. Uh, graduation placement rate is 98% for our degree programs and over 99% for clean energy workforce programs, which I oversee. Um, and that really reflects that our offerings are driven by industry needs and that we work hand in hand with leaders to uh, quickly adapt to changes to ensure that students are competent in new and more efficient technologies within careers that are routinely coined as essential. Um, but before I, I talk a little bit about clean energy workforce programs, I'd like to give the 20,000 foot view of Penn College's academic programs. Um, like I said, 98% uh, placement rate. The two largest majors are IT and nursing. Uh, we're not a research institution, but rather a teaching college focused on the application of applied technologies to support and enhance growing industry needs. There's a program called Penn College Now, which is a dual enrollment program offered in conjunction with schools or career technology centers that feature Penn College courses taught by approved secondary teachers. Penn College Now, uh, that experience allows students to explore a future career option while earning free college credits that can be applied towards one or more majors at Penn College. And there's a total of 45 active partner schools that deliver Penn College Now programs. Um, green careers. There are 28 majors offered at the college, academic programs that are classified as green careers, including several that are focused, uh, that are near and dear to my heart in green buildings, uh, HVAC design, HVAC technologies, residential construction technology and management, and construction management. And the department that I oversee is part of the workforce development arm of Penn College. We are called the Clean Energy Center and our mission is to equip the clean energy workforce with knowledge and skills to create healthy buildings, occupants and communities through energy efficiency. 
So buildings generate about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions and our focus is to teach people how to save energy in buildings and to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions while also making it a healthier and safer environment to live and work in. We were established in 1985 and we've had more than 18,000 worker enrollments since then. Our training footprint extends beyond central Pennsylvania. We're actually doing training throughout the Mid-Atlantic and it's delivered in a combination of online and hands-on training. And we're incorporating some pretty cool new technologies like gaming simulation in our coursework to make it more engaging for younger people to learn. And our flagship Flagship training programs are home energy professional for residential buildings. Um, that will sound familiar to those of you that are familiar with weatherization. It is the national uh, program for weatherization workers. And on the commercial side, building operator certification is our flagship uh, certification program for, um, for those employers. So both of these program areas result in national certifications that are desired by employers and in many times required for employers to do work for, um, for others. Um, and building operator certification in particular has been supported and grant funded by the PA Department of Environmental Protection since 2014 as part of the Commonwealth's goal to reduce energy consumption in commercial buildings. Many of the people that we train in our commercial programs work for school districts and governmental agencies as facilities operations and maintenance staff. Um, all of our clean energy center training programs align with the building energy retrofit priorities that are outlined in the president's American jobs plan. Uh, we work daily with employers that are seeking to hire entry level energy efficiency professionals. We see lots of opportunity to connect with CTEs and schools to promote green building career pathways. And we're continuously working to develop opportunities at the Clean Energy Center and at Penn College to provide multiple entry points for individuals seeking a green career. Um, programs that align with employer workforce needs and training that results in national certifications for post-secondary degrees. Thank you, Allison. Uh, I'm really curious, uh, before we kick it over to Dr. Fullerton, um, you mentioned like the hiring rate and the placement rate. Do you find that that businesses, regardless of their own social responsibility policies, are leaning towards hiring your graduates that are coming from the clean energy sectors? Or are they like, are they asking for one or the other? I'm thinking about that tension between this conversation around like we, we don't have enough folks to hire, we're having trouble hiring people. And if you're a business that maybe doesn't have this bent on focusing on sustainability, are they still willing to hire that group of people or are the, are the skill sets the same? Can, can you speak to that at all? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, there's, a, there's a huge gap in the trades with workforce. Um, there's approximately 50% of the people retire, baby boomers retiring over the next five years, five to 10 years, and there's going to be a huge gap. So there's a lot of um, opportunity for students that are trying to get into a green energy career. We have no problem placing um, somebody particularly in clean energy. Um, there's there's um, a lot of active programs out there to make buildings energy efficient, and there's just not enough workers to do the work. Uh, they're, they're just trying to hire uh, warm bodies and get them into a training program. Um, so we're, we're trying to help them with that strategy, um, the program implementers with that strategy to try to figure out uh, really how to dovetail the um, needs of the local community because these are wage paying jobs. These are family sustaining wages. And um, the best way to, to do this is to really be more have a more diverse workforce so and hire locally. So in the communities that need energy efficiency that have the highest energy burden, drawing, trying to draw in those uh, students 
into these green careers, gives them a path forward and a living wage and helps them contribute back to their own communities. And, and um, I haven't found an employer yet that we work with that didn't want a clean energy certification that we offer. That's awesome to hear. Uh, I think you really set the stage for Dr. Fullerton. I know in the conversation, Dr. Fullerton, you and I had uh, leaning into this panel presentation, you talked a little bit about that perception of green, uh, green careers and green pathways at your at your technical college in the high school in Chester County. And it sounds like Allison's looking for more folks to come into her program. So could you talk a little bit about what you're doing in Chester County and maybe some of the changes you've recently made to ignite more interest in the space? Yes, sir. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. And like the other two panelists, I'm honored to uh, be here uh, today with you. My name is Joe Fullerton. And Currently, as of today, I serve as the principal at the Technical College High School Pickering Campus in Northern Chester County. In two weeks, I will transition to the Assistant Director of the Career and Techno uh, Technical Education Division of the Chester County Intermediate Unit. And my school here is part of the Chester County Intermediate Unit. And we have a partnership with Penn College of Technology and their dual enrollment program. So we're very familiar with uh, Penn College now and uh, taking advantage of giving our students uh, every opportunity to walk through many different doors once they graduate. Uh, but what uh, Mr. Pittman was alluding to is we did have at one time, and we're a technical high school. Uh, we have six different uh, career clusters that we have. Uh, 13 plus programs in which our students can take. And one of those programs up until this, this year was called Sustainable Energy Engineering. And it was a program that it has a basis in electrical occupations, but focused on solar and wind and, and other uh, sustainable energies that are there. However, for whatever reason, the, uh, the communities in our area, that that title and that uh, a type of program uh, resulted in a, a lot of uh, feelings that we couldn't understand why there wasn't more students in, in this particular program based on the need for jobs and employment and it was just an up and coming uh, offering that we had. So this year we decided to change the name back to its root and, and made it electrical occupations, but we're still going to do the uh, wind and solar and they still get the, uh, the sustainable energy piece of it. But with the title change of the program, we have seen our enrollment almost double for next school year. So we, we thought that was rather interesting. The students uh, are coming into this program learning about the basics in electrical work, but also getting a, a great hand in, in what it is to do the solar and, and wind uh, work as well. Uh, we have other technical programs, uh, you know, from uh, automotive service and collision to uh, animal science and cosmetology, culinary arts, and, and everything like that to put students on a pathway to careers. But we really are happy with our electrical program and the sustainable offerings that it has in order to put the students into a Penn College and, and to replenish the workforce uh, that is so desperately in need of workers. And the best part about going third is that the other two panelists have said everything else that needs to be said. So I can uh, stop talking at this point and uh, I'm sure there are some questions or further thoughts. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fullerton. So we had talked a little bit about, um, you know, the opportunities that exist to build connections and raise awareness across sort of this educational continuum. And you all represent different levels of that continuum. Um, what, what are the opportunities to build those supports of, of developing and environmentally focused skills and competencies and building pathways into these construction careers? What would you, what would you wanna, want our, our participants to walk away with that they could do in their communities and, or in their states to ignite the kind of career and technical education that the, the three of you have been sharing? So I'll open that to either of the, any of the panelists that may want to talk a little bit about what are some of those first steps that we should be doing? 
Well, I, I think at the high school level, if I may, uh, the perception is our, our biggest uh, uh, foe or challenge. Um, we have, in this instance, uh, there are plenty of jobs, plenty of careers, uh, wage-sustaining careers, life-sustaining careers in this field. However, people have their own perceptions, parents, students, other school administrators and personnel on what these actually are. So we are, we are at this level looking for partners uh, to put mm -hmm. students out on, on cooperative education so that they're in school part of the day, out in the workforce in the part of the day. Uh, we're looking for people that will open up their doors and allow parents to come in, allow mm -hmm. teachers to come in to get a, a good solid look at what this is all about so that they can make a more informed decision. So we are looking for awareness at this level so that uh, people are getting a true indication of what this work is and what it could lead to um, so that we can be a part of the process of, of improving or uh, giving more numbers to the workforce. Thank you, Dr. Fullerton. So yeah. Joseph kind of talked about like condition setting. I was going to turn to you, Lisa, and I see you just dropped off mute. Uh, what, like, what, what can the state agency do to help exactly where Dr. Fullerton is talking about raising awareness, um, setting those conditions for business and industry partners to open their doors? What, what should agency level folks or decision makers in the, the governor's offices of these states be doing? Yeah, so I, it was funny. I, I, I was thinking how much focus we have on kind of the high school and post-secondary world. And um, one of the things that we're working on uh, with our state agency, but also in conjunction with other state agencies, and again, with our community, is um, really taking a hard look at middle school. And so what does middle school look like? And we're actually going kind of a rethink project, if you will, for middle grades. And uh, when we talk about equity, I don't think you can do that without, you know, focusing on student identity and making sure they see themselves and the opportunities for them in that experience. And of course, building those knowledge and skills and, um, you know, criticality, like how are they going to use those knowledge and skills to make a difference, uh, challenge inequities, improve our communities. Um, and, and I think also it's very important along with that, that there's joy in learning and that we bring that joy. In. And I think making those connections for students helps that happen, making those connections with employers and those who are actually in the field. So I think our, our real opportunities here are to, um, or one of the opportunities is to focus on middle grades and this student awareness and the interest in both uh, green careers and environmental literacy across the board and to help identify their career paths and help uh, channel them in the right direction. And um, also making, again, those connections between in-school and out-of-school learning. And I know I said that several times, I think it's really important for us to draw those intentional lines for students and take what they're learning and to be able to apply it in the communities and be able to um, see how you can make a difference. Um, on the other side, I think, and, and on the other, but yes, wrapped into it, I think another real opportunity um, that we have from the state agency side and you know, really from the executive branch also is to work with employers and help employers, um, you know, realize that really critical role that they play in building awareness of all careers and, and specifically, you know, of course, of green careers. And again, supporting those career awareness and exploration activities early so that um, students are thinking about these types of careers, again, both in and out of the classroom. So that whole continuum of work-based learning, if you look at building awareness and giving exploration opportunities. And then as Dr. Fullerton talked about, um, the opportunities to work in the community and have co-op or internship um, experiences that are truly authentic and engaging with employers. And then making those connections again with the post-secondary and making sure that students you know, understand 
um, and can make those connections and into the um, into careers. But I think as a state agencies, we can also just play that really critical role of convening and information sharing and providing opportunities because we hear from so many employers that they do want to be involved and they do want to engage with students, but they don't always know how to do it. And, and quite frankly, we don't always make it easy for them to do it also. So I think that um, just being kind of that, that conduit to make that happen is super important and looking at that whole continuum as uh, Ms. Steele and, and Dr. Fullerton and, and you also have said, just is super important that we play that role. Thank you, Lisa. That's that's well said. Uh, I'm gonna open it up to the to the folks in the room. Is there any questions? Or I did see that Grace had in the um, in the chat. Uh, are there any examples of? like our CTE space working with programs like Project Lead the Way. And I, I would imagine maybe Dr. Fullerton, you may be most familiar with Project Lead the Way. Um, I, I don't wanna make any presumptions that Allison isn't, but uh, are there any, any um, examples of, of students or programs that are working with Project Lead the Way that then lead themselves into these opportunities with you at the college and the high school or at Penn Tech? Uh, currently, we do not have uh, any partnerships with Project Lead the Way. It, it certainly is a discussion point, but right now we do not. Right. I'm not familiar with Project Lead the Way, although I would love to hear about it. So I don't know if uh, Miss, yeah. if, if Grace wants to come off mute and share at all. Um, sure. Um, I don't know that much about it at all. I, I don't work too closely with our CTE um, office um, in the state superintendent's um, office in DC, but I, I do know that the schools that have um, CTE programming, they're all using some type of project lead the way curriculum. And so for for us in DC, I think that's the entry point uh, it, because it sounds like what you have in both Delaware and Pennsylvania, you have these programs that you've developed specifically for your schools. And I don't know if we can do that, but I do know that they are using Project Lead the Way. And so if there was a way to kind of say, this is how it's used in the Project Lead the Way electrical engineering pathway, then that would help me be able to convince our CTE folks that that's the way to go for now. Thank you, Grace. That's really interesting. Like we find Project Lead the Way sitting on our regular education side of the house a lot. And so like high schools and middle schools that are trying to build these career paths that are outside of career and technical education, they leverage a lot of Project Lead the Way resources. But that's, uh, that might be something that we need to definitely dig back into as a state to think about um, how to use Project Lead the Way in the CTE side of the equation. So thank you for sharing. Uh, are there any other um, questions or comments from the group? I could add, can I just add a little bit to the Project Lead Way? Sure. Quick yeah. reference. So we do have um, a, a couple of the pathways that have been built as a part of Delaware Pathways um, do um, focus on and use Project Lead the Way curriculum. Um, we have engineering and bio, mm -hmm. and then we have some in our middle schools. So a little bit ago, I dropped the Delaware Pathways link into the chat. If you go to that link, you can sort through programs and actually read a little bit more about um, the implementation and, and the programming there too. And if you have any questions, please let me know too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Any other uh, questions or comments from the, the group? Um, I'd just like to reiterate what um, Ms. Stoner was talking about earlier with the really trying to, um, to get younger people immersed in all of their career options for clean energy and environmentally friendly careers because we have, um, like, like you've heard today, we have programs that will 
train them from entry level up, place them right into a job where they're going to where students will make an impact and have a, a clean energy career. Um, the, the missing piece specific specifically for our training program is that the employers are having trouble getting in, younger people interested in it to hire them. And so there's, there's sort of this opportunity for increased communication between the schools and the CTEs and workforce development programs in higher ed to, to, to map out and to maybe um, request, you know, if there's funding to put in place some introductory programs on a local level that resonate with the local community to, to um, really build that pipeline and, and, um, and show the students and their families the, the different options that are out there and the di different career paths that somebody could take because there's so many different ways to um, get into green careers and it's, and it's so needed. I mean, if we're, if we're going to meet our climate goals and workforce goals as well, um, we, we just need to, we need to increase the diversity of people working in this, in this sector. Um, so I, I just, I'm looking forward to it. I think that this is wonderful that we have this group of people together. Um, and I want to encourage the conversation to continue after this too, because there's, there's some real opportunity for everybody and specifically for the younger generation. Yeah, and, and I think as we are really talking about like the green economy and green careers, one of the things in Pennsylvania, at least, is we don't have like a strong definition of what that is within our workforce. It's pretty broad. Um, and so like if we're thinking about additionally beyond the electrical trades or the construction trades, there's other careers that lead into that, whether it's, you know, wastewater operators or drinking water operators or um, careers in and forest products and industries, yeah. there are a lot of spaces that we can ignite interest for learners. And I, I think back to the student voice piece, you know, uh, we think a lot about equity and, and in all of our states and in all of our conversations, especially over the last 18 months. And as we think about, you know, the, the, our rural communities and reminding folks of the, the assets and the opportunities in those spaces, sometimes those green careers may be in industries that we're not necessarily associating with um, weatherization or solar panel installation, but might be on the land management side or the forest mm -hmm. products industry or some of those other spaces. And I think about just lived experience. You know, I grew up in a rural community and I was a hunter and a fisher, and I always wanted to be part of something that worked with that. And if we can tie student interests and agency to a career path, that really gets folks excited about their future. So uh, hey, just, I'll go ahead, Cindy, go for it. No, no, I just, yeah, you know, I was, uh, yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I was, I was going to start about the, you know, the full forest product industry and forest. I mean, maybe, maybe people don't always see the forest product industry and even logging as a green career, but it really is. If you think about, you know, Penn's Woods and, and about half of our public lands are available for forest management and we get certified in sustainable forest management and we want to increase the land base that's in forest land cover and not under cement. And so to do that, you've got to have a workforce that needs forests, and uh, that, that includes uh, managed forests. So, I mean, we just went around the state and dedicated seven new old growth forests. We're big on that too, but we've got a lot of forest land in Pennsylvania or Penn's Woods, and uh, a large portion of that is and can be managed forests and create a lot of careers for the forest product industry. And we're, we're the hardwood capital of the world that's been important for our communities and just building the uh, workforce base and that in that realm. And I know young people don't, you know, unfortunately, um, some of the education that maybe does apply to the uh, rainforest and, and sustainable practice there doesn't apply to Pennsylvania's sustainable forests, where we, we do have natural regeneration and we can do it sustainably. So to get young people to understand the um, you know, forest management as a green career, Mm -hmm. is, a, is a bit of a challenge. So that's why we, uh, we push product, project learning tree and, and the Penn College of Technology has obviously been an important partner to us in the forest product industry. No, so thanks for saying that. Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, waving around on, on uh, mute and without my camera on and I realized uh, <laughs> you couldn't see me. So thanks. Yeah, um, I see Laura Collard has her hand up. Yeah, I actually just wanted to kind of 
say, uh, Cindy, I was going to mention the Project Learning Tree um, Green Jobs um, resources yes. that they have put out in the last um, year. Uh -huh. um, and I know each of the states in D.C. Uh, has Project Le Learning Tree coordinators and mm -hmm. um, professional development in Maryland. Uh, Mayo is the state coordinator, and we've really tried to connect the, um, the green careers mm -hmm. with the PD, the professional learning that we are offering. And I know other partners are doing that as well to make those career connections, um, whether it's forestry, natural resources, and, and energy, as we've talked about today. I think it's really important from elementary school, you know, pre-K on so that pe people are aware, so students are aware of what opportunities there are um, so anyway, I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you, Laura. And I, I think, you know, everyone's right in the space. We need to start early and often with learners and exposing them to what the opportunities are. Uh, you know, there's some, and that there's programs on the fringe that you may not think lead to an environmental sustainability career that are. I'm thinking like drone technologies and kids might be really interested in the unmanned vehicles and, and that space. And they could parlay that into a career that in sustainable uh, and in a sustainable green economy, whether it's surveying work for organizations like uh, Secretary Dunn's or for I see Bert Myers, our friend from DEP on the call, or whether it's like doing uh, monitoring water quality using your unique uh, computer science skills to do, do that on a, a large scale data collection base. There's all kinds of inroads for, for kids to find their passion around the green economy. It's our role at the state agencies to make sure that we make them visible for folks. So uh, we have about a minute left. So I'd encourage everyone, if you get a chance to go back into the Padlet, drop in your ideas, your thoughts, the great work that you're doing in your communities so that we can spotlight that. Uh, and you know, we really appreciate uh, Allison and, and Dr. Fullerton and Lisa for taking time out of their busy days to share their story here with us at the Environmental Literacy Summit and thank each of you for taking your time from your busy schedules to listen and learn and promote the, you know, the opportunities for learners in, in your spaces. Uh, thank you very much for, for the opportunity and, and for listening and sharing.